Okay, yeah, thanks um, everyone for turning up. Also thanks to the GA Pathways team for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. Uh, it's a real honor for me to talk about plate tectonics because it really is one of the, the fundamental processes that shapes uh, things that happen in, uh, within, on, and around the Earth. Um, and also it actually underpins a lot of the work that we do here at, at GA. So many of you would have heard probably um, the basics or even heard the, the term plate tectonics all the way back um, when you were in high school. Um, so you may have a bit of an idea about what plate tectonics is, um, but hopefully by the end of this, uh, this talk you, you'll sort of have a, maybe a, a more robust understanding. Um, a bit of a preview is that it doesn't really operate like this. <laughs> Okay, so before we get into plate tectonics, how, or the, the theory of plate tectonics and um, what it involves, just a couple of fundamental concepts that I think um, we need to sort of understand so we're all on the same page. The first one is the structure of the Earth. And so many of you will know that um, going from the center of the Earth outwards, uh, the, the, the innermost part is the core, and in the core, the, uh, the center of the core, the inner part, is the, the inner or solid core. That's surrounded by a, a liquid part, um, the, the outer core, and there's a movement of the outer core around that solid um, inner core of mostly iron and nickel that generates our magnetic field. Moving outwards from the core, we have the mantle, and the mantle makes up most of the, um, the volume, and, and, or the volume of, of the Earth, and that extends all the way nearly to the, to the outside of the Earth. And then right at the outside, we have the crust. This is what we are standing on at the moment and is what is underlies all the continents um, the, and also the oceans and the ocean basins. Now, the, the crust and the outermost mantle are the most rigid part of the Earth, and they form what's called the lithosphere. And this is, broke, this is what's broken up into those different plates or the different tectonic plates that we're going to be talking about. The second concept um, that I want to get across to you guys is that there are two main types of crust on the Earth. The first is the continental crust, so that is what we're standing on, sitting on, building on at the moment. This is generally thicker, it's generally quite old, uh, it has a composition that's quite similar to granite, so uh, many of you will have seen granite in, on workbenches or a lot of the things like gravestones for example, quite a hardy, a hardy rock. But the key thing is that it has a, has a relatively low density um, for most of the rocks that we, that we see uh, on the Earth. And that's a typical example of granite. We can, you can have a look at that um, after the talks. I think Steph will also talk about that as well. Now, oceanic crust, on the other hand, that underlies uh, most of the, uh, the major oceans on the Earth. That is generally thinner, um, about 7 to 10 kilometers thick. It's a lot younger in general than most of the continental crust. This has a composition that's very similar to basalt, so that, that black, um, very dense uh, rock that you may have seen if in many cities they form the, um, the paving stones or other building stones. Melbourne, for example, if you walk around the CBD, you'll be walking on a lot of basalt. And like I said, it has a, has a higher density than granite. So we'll go through again why this is a bit more important later on. And you can have a go at hefting or sort of weighing these samples to see if you can uh, tell that the density dif difference between those two rock types um, that are uh, available after the talk. Okay, so what's the big deal about plate tectonics? How, why is it important and how did it come to be the major sort of theory that underpins a lot of Earth processes? Well, the, the surprising thing is that it's a relatively modern idea. There were some early ideas from the 16th century about um, how continents uh, moved around, but it wasn't really fully accepted by, by geologists in the wider scientific community until the early 1960s. The modern theory was developed uh, in the early 20th century by a guy called Alfred Wegener. Now, he was not a geologist, he was a, a meteorologist. Um, so if you need some inspiration for innovation, this guy set the bar really high. So he basically uh, condensed and formulated a lot of evidence into a theory, an early sort of precursor theory to what we now call plate tectonics, and that was called continental drift. Now I'll just go through some of the evidence that he sort of pulled together. Um, it's not a, there are lots of different lines of evidence, but here's some of the main ones. Now the first one is that 
people had looked at the, the outlines of the continents after we've sort of been able to map an image and what the Earth looked like um, sort of over the last few hundreds of years. And people started looking at the, the shapes of these continents and thinking that they, they almost like a jigsaw, some of them. You can almost see some of them fitting together if you move them around. And so South America and Africa are two of the, two of the best examples of this. And, and, uh, and people think that around 200 million years ago, um, they fitted together like this and have now drifted apart um, to their current position. The second line of evidence for uh, continents having once been sort of together at some point and mo uh, moving apart are when we look at the, the types of rocks that we see on the edges of these continents today and also their ages. And a lot of them um, are, the, are very similar. They're now on very distant uh, continents, um, but they have the same characteristics, the same ages, which leads us to believe that they might have been once um, connected together and again have drifted apart. <coughs> Other lines of evidence, going back to Tegan's talk of, of paleontology, is when we look at the uh, distribution of, of, uh, of fossils. So we're talking exclusively now about uh, sort of land fossils, the ones, or land animals, the ones that, that couldn't fly across continents, so they would have had to have sort of uh, walked everywhere. Um, we find a lot of fossils, or similar age fossils in rocks, that are, again, uh, across now very, dis very distant continents. And, and the most elegant explanation for this is that they were once um, joined, or the continents were once joined, so the animals could, could freely move across those, uh, those continents or land bridges. And when they died, they deposited their fossils into those layers and beds, which are now separated by, by vast oceans. And there are other forms of evidence, things like glaciation um, and other things. OK, so vagueness ideas weren't really accepted until the 1960s. <clears throat> And it really um, took off quite quickly after that with advances in technology when we were able to map the, um, the, uh, the sea floor and in particular looking at things like the age of, the age of oceanic um, rocks. So when we look at um, the magma that comes out of what we call spreading centers, I'll go through these in a minute. So this is where we have plates diverging, magmas being um, extruded into lava and deposited onto the oceanic crust. We see that it's sort of symmetrical, it, it sort of forms symmetrical patterns away from those ridges. So it's in the, in the, or suggesting that we're sort of see, seeing a spreading of those, um, of those plates. And what really sealed, sealed the deal was when we were able to, to date the ages of those rocks coming out when they had cooled down and to, to age them using things um, similar to, to what we do here at GA um, using, using the shrimp. And you can, what happened is there, you can see the red colors are ages of oceanic rocks that are very young, and the, the greens and the blues are much older. So when you move away from these uh, areas that are creating new magmas today, we see the ages getting older and older and older, the further you generally get away from these, um, from these ridges. And also the oldest rocks that we've dated from, from the, ocean, the oceanic basins is about 190 to 200 million years old. At the same time, or sort of a similar, a similar time, geophysics or geophysicists were starting to, to image um, what happens away from these, these diverting, diversion margins uh, and seeing what happens when the, the oceanic crust actually subducts. Remember, it's a lot denser than the continental crust, where we have oceanic crust meeting uh, continental crust. It's always the denser oceanic crust that subducts. And these are what's called subduction zones. And we were able to start imaging uh, things like earthquakes, what depth they occur at, and, also, and eventually um, being able to image the actual subducting slab going down uh, into the mantle. And then finally, more modern techniques such as GPS, global positioning, we were able to see actually the movements of individual continents uh, on, the Earth's, on the Earth's surface. And the main reason why people had a bit of a, a struggle to um, rationalize or accept plate, tecton plate tectonics was that there wasn't really a mechanism that was available um, to explain what was going on. And eventually we, we now understand that in general the main process that's driving plate tectonics is mantle convection. So it's in its, in its simple, simplest sense we have hot material rising uh, at some point in the mantle. Some people think it's, it, gen it starts sort of at the core mantle boundary. The hot material rises, it drives apart those mid-ocean ridges 
as it cools, it sort of comes, <coughs> comes back down and helps to drag down those, those oceanic crust in those subduction zones. So here's a, a sort of overview of a large region of the Earth here. We can see that the crust or the lithosphere is created at those mid-ocean ridges or spreading centers. And it's sort of destroyed or recycled back into the, into the mantle at, uh, at subduction zones there. So you can think of the whole process like a conveyor belt, where we have the mid-ocean ridges, these things here, um, forming new crust and subduction zones returning that crust uh, back down into the mantle. So here's what we, um, here's our best um, understanding of what the current tectonic plate framework is uh, on the Earth. The, all those sort of stitched lines you can see there, so the best example is perhaps in the Atlantic there, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, those are those spreading centers. Uh, so plates moving apart, creating new crust. And those lines with the, um, the barbed lines or the ones with the triangles on, those are those subduction zones where we're seeing the, the subduction of the oceanic crust, either beneath other uh, oceanic crust or uh, beneath um, the less dense continental crust. And there are some examples of the plate tectonic jigsaw plates um, that we've got from the Ed Center, which you can have a look at and play around with and try and fit them together afterwards. Now the cool thing about plate tectonics is that it hasn't always looked like this and we can use um, various lines of evidence to s sort of back calculate uh, what, what has happened to the plates in the past and how they've come to form um, their current configuration. So I'll just show you um, one of the um, reconstructions from around 300 million years ago uh, to the present state. So see if you can track uh, what's happened to Australia. It's actually started down here, so it's this purple area here and this was starting at 300 million years ago so this is when we had a sort of all the continents were sort of joined together to form what we call Pangaea and the southern part of Pangaea you might have heard of um, is called Gondwana or Gond Gondwana land so let's play this and you can see uh, what's happened so you can get the age of the dinosaurs now Okay, so it's time for your uh, red and green cards, and we're going to play plate tectonics prices right. So the question is, how fast, on average, how, how fast do tectonic plates move? Okay, so the first one is, do you think they move faster or slower than glaciers? So if you think they move faster, hold up your green bits of paper. If you think they move slower, hold up your red. Okay, yeah, mostly, mostly red. So red is the correct answer. So glaciers move on average about one meter per day. It varies, but that's about the average. So tectonic plates move slower than that. How about a snail? So again, do you think they move faster or slower than snails? Snail pace. Great, I think, yeah, red's the overwhelming majority there. So snails actually move on average around 47 meters per hour. That's pretty quick, right, snails? <laughs> okay, how about how fast your fingernails grow? Faster or slower? <coughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much 50-50. And it's actually around, that's the, actually around the speed that plate tecton, or plates move. Some are a bit faster, some are a bit slower, but in general, how fast your fingernails grow, that's about how fast uh, most tectonic plates move. That's around four centimeters a year. It varies between about two and, two and 10 centimeters a year for tectonic plates. Now, Australia is on, um, I've got an example here. So Australia sits on the Indo-Australian plate. 
So Australia here, India here. We think perhaps there may be a bit of uh, rupture between India and Australia, somewhere in the, uh, the Southern Ocean there. Um, it's one of the fastest moving um, plates, and Australia is actually probably the fastest moving continent on Earth. And that's moving at about seven centimetres, pretty much uh, north uh, per year. And we'll come back to why this is important in a second. So here you go, here's that same image. And now if you have a look at these green arrows, you can see that the direction of these plates are moving. And the length of those arrows dictates how fast they're moving. So here you go, here's, a north, here's the uh, Australian plate here. It's moving pretty much north, uh, one of the fastest rates on the Earth. So why is all this important? Why is it important for us as, as humans? And why is it important um, to understand this uh, for our work at GA? Well, firstly, plate tectonics is one of the major reasons why we have Earth hazards. And two of the main uh, ones I'm going to talk about are, the first one is earthquakes and the tsunamis that earthquakes may generate. And if you have a look at this uh, image here, hopefully you can see this, that all these circles, these sort of white or beige circles, are earthquakes with a magnitude greater than six that have happened um, since uh, 2005 to 2015. And you can see they generally occur, a lot of them, well, most of them occur at these, at or on these plate margins. And actually, a lot of the earthquakes that form are actually forming at these subduction zones, where we're seeing plates being subducted um, beneath other plates here. So a good example is uh, to the north, the northern, uh, or New Zealand, and to the north of New Zealand there. Secondly, volcanoes, or, or uh, volcanic activity, is again um, largely responsible from plate tectonics. So again, in these subduction zones, you're getting a lot of uh, magma being produced, and again, this is a, this is a whole talk in itself, um, but you see a lot of magma production and volcanics being produced, especially those big explosive volcanoes at subduction zones there. And a good example is where you have the, the Nazca plate, which is a bit of oceanic lithosphere being subducted beneath um, the South American plate there, and the magma is being produced to form a long line of um, volcanoes uh, in South America. So you can see that Australia is pretty much surrounded on three sides by those natural hazards, all um, uh, generated because of the action of plate tectonics. So natural resources. A lot of the work we do is in natural resources, whether it be minerals, oil, gas, things like um, carbon sequestration, geothermal power as well is important. Now, plate tectonics, um, like I said, generates or helps generate a lot of these magmas or hot rocks um, beneath the surface, which often drives groundwater and produces what we call hydrothermal fluids which are one of the main agents of extracting, transporting, and concentrating a lot of the um, precious minerals and metals that we um, extract from the earth and, and require for building various things. So for example, gold, silver, and copper, uh, a lot of those uh, precious metals are formed ultimately from the action of plate tectonics and the magmas um, they produce. Secondly, um, plate tectonics often is able to produce what we call sedimentary basins, so big sort of um, areas that we can accumulate big thick piles of sediments that are really um, conducive for forming things like fossil fuels that we can um, extract. But also, we can th these same areas can be really good places uh, potentially that we can sequester uh, things like carbon dioxide uh, into those into those similar rocks. And then finally, for natural resources, again, those hydrothermal fluids from hot rocks and hot magmas can be harnessed, uh, things like geothermal power, um, within and on the, on the surface. So at places like um, Iceland, for example, most of their power comes from, these, uh, uh, from geothermal power, from ultimately the actions of plate tectonics producing these hot magmas and hot rocks and hot fluids beneath the surface. So finally, um, it's quite uh, topical at the moment we talk about global positioning. So again, if you have a look at this map here, you can see the general sort of forms of some of these um, movement of plates on the, on the Earth. And it's really important to understand how the plates are moving and how fast they're moving, because this has a big impact into things like um, global positioning. So whether this be through, um, through handheld devices or things like um, GPS units, driverless technologies like that. It's becoming much more important these days to become as um, highly precise as we can with where we are on the Earth and how it's moving. 
And you might have read a lot of articles uh, recently um, featuring um, Dan Jackson and his team about um, coming up with a new datum or a new reference uh, frame for where we are in the world in Australia. And that's because the last datum that came out was in about 1994. And since then, Australia has moved around <coughs> one and a half metres. And this is one of my favourite images on the BBC website, which is actually uh, we've moved about the height of a kangaroo. <laughs> um, it's really important to, I guess, to get across to you also that plate tectonics is not a sort of a closed science. We know a lot about it now, but there's still things we don't understand. Um, like in a lot of sciences, it's an evolving process. So things um, like uh, what happens, what's going to happen to um, the configuration of plates in the future is a bit of a hot topic. And also what happens to those subducting slabs when they go down into the mantle is another area of research. You know, do they completely melt as they go down? Do they form some sort of um, slab graveyard um, and they just sit there for a while? And if they do, what, what location is this? Um, so we're, we're generally updating our, our knowledge on, um, on plate tectonics um, as we go. I just want to leave you with uh, one of the models that we think, uh, this is one of the reconstructions or projections that we think uh, will happen to the Earth in the next um, few hundred million years. So again, it's a similar form to the video before and see, you can see, see if you can see what happens to Australia um, in, what, in this particular model here. Okay, so you can see that we're, we're going to initially become much closer um, friends with our, with our Southeast Asian um, <laughs> colleagues and, and friends. Yep, so like I said, there's some activities and some props to have a, have a play around with um, after, the, uh, after the talks. But... Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll stop there. Thanks a lot. So, thanks, Chris. <laughs>